So, where we left off last time was we did our first CRUD part of the um, Elixir application. For those of you that don't know what, what CRUD is, it is basically... If you have, let's say, playlists, so that's what I have here, right? I'm talking about playlists. You want to be able to create, update, and delete them, right? So I want to say, like, okay, I can create a playlist. If I make a typo in the title, I want to be able to update the, t the title, or I want to change the URL, so I update the playlist. And you want to be able to delete it. So that's exactly what CRUD stands for. It stands for Create, Read, Update, and Delete. Which is, like, the most common four things in, in any application. Um, so Elixir already has this built in, uh, Phoenix already has this built in. We're using Phoenix and, uh, so we basically scaffolded a, a couple of like resources here and we're just going to work from this and basically have a better understanding of what's going on. So. Um, I already explained this last time, but let's explain it again. Most web applications um, make use of a system called MVC, which stands for um, Model View Controller, which basically means that, um, well, it's easier if I scaffold a new resource, but um, if, you, if you hit a certain route, so let's say you go to playlists here, you basically say, okay, playlist slash playlist should go somewhere, you know, if so, that's basically what I said here. So I said, okay, if you hit the website and you go to, to slash playlist, you go to the controller. So that's the C in MVC, you know, like model view controller, we go to the controller. So if you hit, if you as a user go to a website, you hit a certain route, which is the URL basically, so you hit slash playlists. And then your application decides what it wants to do in that situation. Um, how's it going to make a login page for the bot shizzle? I mean, I can already log in. I literally already do that. Thanks so much for the follow, whoever that was. Let me see. Easton, thanks so much for the follow. Oh my god, password managers. Uh, I don't know which one this is. Hope it's this one. Yep, it is this one. So I can already see like whoever, like where all the points are coming from. So I can see exactly like how much people gamble too. So people, they use the roulette command. There's over... 57 pages full of people that gambled. So you can use roulette. I can see whoever roulette when and how much points they went in with and how much if they lost or won. Um, which is fun because like I, I basically log everything. You know, every every time somebody like roulettes, I can see that. Yo, Marzart, thanks so much for the follow, which is cool because let's say I'm not sure if you guys ever heard like heard of the Pornhub statistics that they release every year or so. But I got a little inspired by that, that they're able to granularly check like what is going on. Um, so it would be cool that I could actually, based on this, I could actually see people's win rate when they roulette, if I wanted to. Because I can see like if the points are minus, they lost. If, they, if it's positive, then they won. So I can basically see that, oh, okay, when, when they... The amount of like wins and losses, I can exactly see that. And... Um, then there is the stats. I can basically check like the overall win rate from everyone if I wanted to. I can see how much people spent on the stream pretty much or in the chat at least. Um, there's even a subscriber anniversary, but that's not used yet. So whenever you resub, you get more points and shit. But I can see like every five minutes you get 50 points. It's been going on for quite a bit now. 7,000 pages already. <laughs> yep. That's pretty crazy. What hub? Boy, porn hub, man. But have you guys ever seen the statistics on that? It's nuts. It's nuts. Great layout? Yeah, thanks. Um, 
Then the leaderboards, obviously, this is just like on the website. It's cached every time. I can manage the playlists here. So I could say like, oh, I'm not listening to, let's add one actually. We're listening now to, what is it? NCS releases. Let's steal this one. So now we're listening to NCS releases Spotify. So this one, this could be cool. Like if I checked, I could add that it checks the URL and it shows a little Spotify logo maybe, but that's just for future. So now it says like this one is active now. So if I go to the website, it should show that this one is now this. Perfect. Hey, Yo, M0123456678, thanks so much for follow. Um, so that's a little something. So I can manage my, my CAD drawings here, my users, some applications, some social media images. So this is like better for SEO when you link something. I can manage the point sources. So in total for the amount of points, so like every single time you get points, it's a transaction. So like you can look at it from your bank perspective. The amount of points that you have is literally just a sum of all the transactions. So if you were to roulette, if you were to get points from the chat or whatever, you just get extra balance, you know, like you, you look at your bank account, it's just a sum of like all the transactions you get, you got into your account and like, uh, removed from your account. So there's over 358 thousand transactions already and there's 138,400 like the old system like we were at doing it every minute but now we switch to every five minutes it's a little less strain on the database it's not that bad though and i mean 30 358,000 is not a lot but it's already gambled like two two thousand eight hundred forty seven forty nine times it's pretty pretty decent pretty nice Oh, the fuck command. Yeah, the fuck command used to cost points. That's not a thing anymore, but the fuck command is still there. <laughs> so yeah, so we're trying to rebuild this. So what I, what we already built is basically you can add a playlist and a URL. And it will, you can view it, which is the read. So you have CRUD, right? So CRUD basically means that you can create a read, update, and delete. So I can show one, which is reading. So I can read the playlist. I can edit it if I want to. And I can delete it if I want to. So it's nice that we already can do, are able to do that. We now just have to style it and we need to make an admin page. So let's see if we can make an admin page, I suppose. And, and like at least understand what this crud actually built for us. So, um, So in MVC, we have models, views, and controllers. Controllers are literally just like, people go to the website, they hit a URL, the application decides which controller is gonna handle this. So this, you can see that the slash route, so if I go to slash, or just like the root, it's handled by the page controller. But if we go to slash playlist, it's handled by the playlist controller. So every single um, resource on the website is managed by one controller so every url is managed by a controller so that you don't get like you, do, you don't do everything in one in one page is everything is divided and everything has their own responsibility so the responsibility of the controller is to get the right data and pass it onto the view so the controller takes your request he's like hey thanks you're hitting you're hitting playlist that's awesome let me just get you the right data so I'm asking the model here. Um, so the index page is basically this overview page. That's this this overview page right here. And I ask and I ask the plays model, which is which contains the data. Um, I can and talk to the database to like get me all give me a list of playlists. That's basically what I'm asking here. So I'm asking the playlist, hey, do you have any playlists for me? So I'm like. I'm passing it to the controller. The controller is like, hey, okay, you're hitting the index page. Let me get you the playlist and then I'll pass it through, you know, like a machine or a factory. Exactly. So like the controller is just the controller. He just controls and manages shit. It's like the manager. He's like, hey, 
playlist, bro. Just calls up the playlist. Hey, man, can you pass me the playlist? And he's like, the model just just gets the gets the request, and he's like, oh, sure, man, I can I can uh, get you all the playlists. So he asks the database, hey, can I get all of the playlists that I have? And then he gets it from the database, and he passes it on to the controller. So the controller gets it, gets all the playlists, and then they call render. And I tell it to render index.html and then the playlist. So this gets passed over to the view and the view is basically what's being rendered. So the view gets this when he goes to the playlist view and it's using a um, a convention. So it's using uh, just against a web. I'm not adding any methods here. And then we told it, we told it to render index.html. So we're going to pl templates, playlist, index.html. And here all of a sudden you see, you see HTML and you can see that we make use of the um, add sign playlist, which basically is the playlist from the controller. So that's basically what it is. So that's basically MVC in short. It's just like the controller receives the request and he's like, okay, what do I have to do with this? And then he's like, oh, I need to ask for playlist. So I'm gonna ask the playlist model, which controls the connection to the database. That's basically where all the data is. So I'm asking, hey, playlist, can you give me all the playlists? He's like, sure. I pass it through the view. The view is like, okay, I got the data. I can now render. So I render HTML. That's basically what happens. Um, data is in a database, yes. And database, you can kind of like look at as, as, as Excel sheets, like huge Excel sheets where every single thing is the same. So you could say a playlist like contains if we go to the place model i think we can even show you that um i haven't really figured out yet where everything is because this is completely new for me too oh here it is so here's a playlist model so a playlist model in the database consists of a title and a url so you can basically look at this and timestamps so you can basically look at this at, at an excel sheet so let's say we open up docs.google.com. Probably have to log in, which kind of sucks. Yeah, it sucks. Open Excel. Excel online. Without having to log in. Give it to me. Really, dude? CSV online. Why don't you use Symphony? Because I don't like PHP. <laughs> At all. And I want to learn a functional language. So this is actually functional. So it looks kind of like similar to, um, looks kind of similar to Symphony actually, or at least it looks similar to Laravel. It looks similar to Rails, similar to every, any like MVC, but this is actually functional. And I'm still trying to understand like what the big deal about this is. And I'm still honestly like figuring out what, what it has generated for me. So this is all generated code. I didn't go through this manually. This is a, apparently the CRUD um, convention to do it this way. So I'm, I'm still figuring out how they did everything. So we have a model or like a schema. And then we have this. So this is the model, I think. So we ask playlists. Yeah. So this is the model. This is the schema. So they make a clear distinction between that and a model, which is not the case in Rails. So that's a big difference. So this is a repo. This is not even a model. This is this is what they call a repo. And then this is probably a model, but then it is a schema. That's interesting. Oh, welcome Ice Village. How's it going? A base for our data, for our data, database. Aren't with guns and barbed wire fencing. Yeah. Beam clunk knows. Could have been first place. I've lost everything. Holy shit, if you won that. 864,000. Wait, you weren't first place? Oof. Do 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 do. Alright, let's, let's read on. Uh, let's read upon this. So it's gonna be a lot of reading because this is completely new for me. I can't like show you guys fancy stuff because. I'm just learning you guys what what I th know about this. Other than that, I, everything is new for me. 
So I can only compare this to the other NPC frameworks that I've used. But other than that, this is all completely new. So let's take a look at Ecto. So most web application today needs some form of data validation and persistence. Exactly. So that's why we have like an ORM. An ORM is like a, what does it actually stand for? I don't even know. Online object role modeling. Really, object relation mapping. That is what it is actually. Object role modeling? What the fuck? Is that the translation to Dutch? There's no translation. This is an ORM. So I think, uh, I think an ORM is actually only, well, we'll see. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba, let's see, what does it do? Ba -ba -ba. I don't know if uh, Postgres is configured. We already have this, so it doesn't really matter that much. All right. A couple of files will be generated with this task. So we generate a schema, users, and then the table users, name string, email string, and then bio is a string, and a number of pets is an integer. So it creates a file, a lib file for that resource, user.x, and then a migration to create that table. So the model is called user, or like the schema is called user. So they call it schemas, they don't call it models. So, because it's not really a model, because it doesn't contain the data. This thing is just like, this is what a schema looks like. This is the change set for it, with some validations. Um, so it creates a migration for it. We run the migration. So for those of you that don't know what migration says, no ID fields, ID fields are automatic. They always have an ID field. So you don't have to specify in the schema. Um, so what are migrations? So if you ever need to change, um, so let's say you, you have a couple of, you have a couple of Excel sheets, right? You have a couple of Excel sheets and at some point during the, the ap application, you're like, oh, you know, fuck it. Um, we did an extra column. So we're like the playlist now also needs a description or like the playlist, the playlist Excel sheet has a table, has a title and a URL. It, it also needs the platform that it's on. So Spotify, YouTube, like whatever. Um, so then we need to write a migration to actually add that column to it. So migrations are basically like things you programmatically can add or delete from the database. So like anything database related, you can do that in migration. So you so you can easily uh, roll it back as well if you need that. Um, got the head out. Good luck with the programming, Boyd, and enjoy the stream. Yo, Marzart, thanks so much for, for for hanging out with us today, and thanks for the follow. Catch you later, bro. Have a good evening. Have a good night. It's already pretty late. Um. So when I run this task, it says that we created a user exe file containing our Acto schema with our schema definition of the files we passed to the ta task. Next, the migration file was generated so we can show you the migration for the page. So it just basically tells, um, tells the database, whatever the database is, it's like an abstraction on top. So it doesn't actually do raw queries to the database. It says create a table for playlists, which is like create an Excel sheet for, for playlists, add a column for title, which is a string, which means text, and then a URL, which also is text, and then timestamps. So timestamps creates like two columns like this. Um, created that, and then it's like a, a daytime, and then updated that. This is basically what playlist, what what timestamps does. So you don't have to write that yourself. Having a database for rolling it back. It's not a database for rolling it back. It is basically keeping track of the changes that you make to your database. So let's say you make a, a change that you remove the column URL. Well, removing column is a little, is a little shit, but it's like a way to um, see the history of the changes you've made to the database. 
So I could make another migration to update the table playlist to add a new column called like platform. I would make I would make a new file with only like this. Something like this, like update. Something like this, you know? This would be another migration. And then you would if you were to run on a clean database all the migrations, you would like go all do all of them one by one. Um so the, the database is in the exact state that you want it to be in. That's basically what it is. Functions to make new columns. Yeah. So like these are functions. Uh let me show you. This is a function. Create can also be written as this. Think. And then the do block is like it is a block. So create takes this first argument. The thing is like with Elixir, you can write it multiple ways. You can you can actually remove the parentheses if you want. I think I can even do this. But I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> We're still learning here, you know? But this is this is uh this is this is definitely this. 100 percent The first argument is the is the name of the column, which is an atom. And then the second argument is the type. And you can add more arguments probably like um nullable or whatever. Something like that. Now we're familiar with the col column. The column is um an atom. That is a an interesting data type that I've no, don't really know what to use for it to see yet. But an atom is really interesting. So it's not a string. It's a is a constant whose name is its own value. Exactly. name as its own value so like if i were to print this title atom it would always give back the atom title so this is good for comparing i think um you have a maximum amount like the the, the um Erlang vm has like a full set of all the atoms in your application so they only created once and then they're just reused so i think they're all always in memory so like all your atoms are always in memory because there's there's never more than this but they're so tiny that it doesn't really matter but like you make a constant string called blah and then the values in blah is blah Um, well, it's not a string. It's not a constant string because it's not a string. I mean, if you were to make a string, you would make a string. It's just for comparing. So you would, most of the times you would see atoms being used for in within uh, tuples, I think. Yeah, so you can see like, okay, hello. They would match against okays. So like, if you check like, is... Um, do you have an example of this? No. Oh. It's good for matching, so yeah. It's basically just to tell them the state of something. I mean, I don't honestly understand it completely myself, so like that's why that's why we're doing this. But that's why we're building something with it. Just to understand it a little better. Oh, they actually don't have created that. It's actually inserted that. Wow. Okay. So the users table here looks like this. It has an ID. It can never be nil. It's always the next. It's always increments with one. It's a far char. Wait, it's a far char. Wow. How do I make a bigger text then? Time for me. Time that I leave for today. Time to find my bed. Yo, feels feels scale man. Have a good night, man. Have a good night. So this is like a common thing you will see. So it's a tuple with the first 
argument, first element being okay, if it's okay, and then the second is like the data you want. 70 people watching coding, Monk has, dude. Um, this is configuring the database, the schema. The active schemas are responsible for mapping Elixir values to the external data source, in this case, the database, as well as mapping external data back into Elixir data structure, in Elixir data structures. Right. We can also define relationship to other schemas in our application. For example, our user schema might have many posts and each post would belong to a user. That makes sense. That's exactly the schema that we have for the for the relationships of the the, the Twitch bot. Um, think if I show you guys what I have on the we open our Ruby app and we take a look at our models. This is the, what's currently being used. And we go to Twitch users. A Twitch user has many point transactions. And a point transaction is something that belongs to a Twitch user and it belongs to a source. It's above my level. It's okay, I, I don't understand it myself that well either. I feel like I'm, I'm back in a class below my level. <clears throat> it's been a while since I've been in that situation. Look at that, raw queries even. That's a long time. Because we want to do a book updates, I think. Yeah, no. Update Twitch user, set points is equals points plus the new amount. This is a database trigger, so they need to be raw. Amount should never be below zero. Oof. Look at this. Rank over blah blah blah. <laughs> God damn. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on here. What's up, Cassinome? How's it going? So, this is a model, and a model does a lot more than it does, than schemas do in Elixir. Um,. Because if, if you look at a schema in Elixir and compare this to this, um, this is all a schema does. It's kind of similar, but they're like scopes and they're other things like actually hitting the repo is done with their, your own methods. So you can create these yourself instead of having like calling those on the model. You pass it a repo. No, this is a repo. And you pass it. Yeah, you pass it a model. So you basically make yourself a, a nice function that makes it easier for you to call repo all playlists. By the way, in Elixir, this it automatically returns. So you, that's why you don't see return. This always this already returns this. So like the last line of the code always returns. If you want to do an explicit return, you can do a return in the meantime. So let's say you have a guard class or whatever. So it's like if something, uh, it's probably like this. You want to say like, oh, if something else, you want to return something else, you can still return, but like you don't have to, because it's, it already knows. No idea what's going on, but it's relaxing to listen to. <laughs> Appreciate that, man. Um. So it imports elect, elect, uh, ecto queries, which I don't know what the what those methods are all about. It creates kind of like a struct that thing. This is and compare this to that. You pipe it to a chain set with a set of attributes, and then you insert it in the database. Now I wonder what this is. Arrays in C++ are kind of hard. I've never learned C++ or C and like ever. I don't know what this is. I wonder what this syntax is. Let's see if they explain it. I'm curious. 
But let's first go back to the schema. So the schema is just define like what our schema is and it has a set of uh, validations before you hit the database, right? It's the stuff that like needs to be done before the before you hit the database. Like a set of rules. Um, okay, this is what it generated for us. So, active schemas at their core are simply elix elixir structs. See, this is a struct. I see. So I was right. This is a struct. So it creates a struct of the schema, and then you pipe the the chain set. So this is piping, by the way, and then we pass chain set. So Change, change set the function returns a function. That's why we can pipe it. Or at least in Elixir, it probably does some magic, some curry, curry magic. But like, change set is like this. Oh, schema. This is kind of what the function is. So playlist change set takes attributes and then returns a function that takes a schema. That is the reason why we can pipe it. So. On this on the playlist, we pipe it to change set. So basically this is being this is this is how it's being called right now. Like this. And then the result of this is passed to the next one. Like this. So this is basically what this does. But th that's like really hard to read because without pipes, you have to read this the other way around. So like you would have to first evaluate this. Then you have to jump out and then you have to jump out. So you're reading it the other way around. You cannot say like the re repo insert and then repo this and then you go here. So what you do instead is you pipe it, which makes it a little more readable because then you know like, oh, you take the playlist, you throw it into the change set and then the result of that goes into the repo insert. That's basically what it is. Um, and I really like this syntax and I really hope they bring this to JavaScript as well because it's it's so nice. There's already like initiatives for this. Um, pipe JavaScript. JavaScript pipe. Pipe operator. So this is ex experimental. I don't think it's... See, it's a proposal still. PC39 proposal pipe operator. Which is cool, you know? I want this. So let's say you have double say, capitalize, and exclaim. This is how you would normally write this. So you want to say hello, you want to say double say hello, so it turns to hello, hello, and then capitalize it, and then exc exclamation mark at the end. That's a lot of, this is like a lot harder to read, you know, like exclaim. Oh, I have to write, read this from the inside out because it's the other way around. Uh, but instead of you read it like this, you take hello, you double say it, capitalize it, and then you exclam exclamation mark it. This is what the result is. So that would be really cool if we could do that. That would be super nice. Is Boyd a Dutch name? I have a friend named Boyd from Netherlands. It's not a Dutch name. It's actually an... Um, it's an English last name. So a lot of like English people are, I think Scottish even, the Scottish thing um, that like they use Boyd as a last name. But Butch, Boyd is not really a Dutch name, but I am Dutch. Um, all right, here we go. So we go from the schemas to chain sets. So how Ecto works, so normally on models, which is super strange, you would, in Ruby, you would change the model and then save or update, and then it would update those changes that are in the model to the database. But because um, in El Elixir, you don't really have state, so you don't have classes that initiate, instantiate, and then contain a bunch of data. You, um, 
you have to make a change set instead. So you pass it the model. You pass it the model and the attributes that you want to update. That's basically what it is. So that's why they made a, a chain set here. In the elixir here, chain set. So it takes a playlist. It takes attributes. And then it validates those attributes to the attributes that are here. They're allowed to be passed, basically. So you take the playlist, put that in cast. So this like, kind of like validates, hey, are you sending the wrong, are you not sending random values that you're not supposed to change in the database? And then it pipes it to the value that comes out of that. It pipes it to validate required and it checks if these two are present because these are required to be set. Um, so define a pipeline of transformations or data needs to undergo before it is ready to be uh, for our application to use. These transformations might include typecasting, user input validation, filtering, out uh, any ex uh, extraneous parameters. Often we'll use changes to validate user input before writing it to the database. Exactly. Ecto repos are also chain set aware, which allows them not uh, not only to review invalid data, but also perform minimal database updates possible by injecting inspecting the chain set to know which fields have changed. Um, let's take a closer look at our default chain set functions. Right now, we have two transformations in our pipeline. In the first call, we invoke ecto chain sets as three. Uh, right, so let's take a look at Alec, uh, chain set. Can we see what the stuff is here? I want to see what the what are the different oh so they have a chain set no i want to see all the different chain sets all right fuck it it says this is like the third function cast cast three holy fucking moly everybody's hosting me today <laughs> nadine thanks so much for the host girl how was your stream oh my goodness all right, if you guys haven't checked out Nadine yet, check her out. Fantastic streamer, by the way. She's also learning the guitar, and she's actually super good at it already, which is a little scary, actually. The way she strums is, like, ridiculously good already. But thank you so much for the, for the raid, Nadine. How was your stream? What's up, Percy? Check me out. Yeah, check her out. Part of the Infinium stream team. Definitely worth a follow. She plays all kinds of different games. And she recently picked up guitar play. So definitely, definitely hey worth it. Yo, Lang, thanks so much for the follow as well. Appreciate that. Coding stream greater than league stream. Shadow Raptor, welcome. How's it going, my dude? Did you only do guitar stream, uh, Nadine? Or did you switch to games later? Shadow Raptor going ham. That's a good raid, bro. That's some good shit. They're gonna sleep. Tired. I tired, but not really. <laughs> that sounds great. Ruz Gato Gosu, welcome. How's it going? Shadow turning into a panda. <laughs> Play nothing else matters. When you want to get off the darkest well, nothing else matters. Wait, what is that? What can we do with this language? What's up, Amaral? How's it going? It's a functional programming language, and we're learning Phoenix, which is a framework. You guys have ever heard of like Ruby on Rails or Laravel? It's super similar. I had to alternate between three spam messages to evade anti spam mode. What's up, Amaral? How's it going? I mean, if you send more than 30 messages, Per minute or so? I think you get banned for three hours. Yo, crew fire, thanks for your follow as well. Um Spam does not get longer. 
What's up, Lil? Put 10 guys again. Hope you had a good stream, uh, Nadine. Hope you had a good stream. Please check her out, though. She's really worth a follow, for sure. Worth. You're you're gonna guaranteed have a good time. Um. Should make it food right now. I see. I see. All right. Let's so continue. So it can be a little bit boring because I'm learning a language. I'm learning a framework. Um, I can only the only thing I can do is compare it to the frameworks that I have worked with and the languages that I have worked with So that's basically what I'm doing. I'm just like live Learning while trying to explain what I think is what it is and then validate whatever it actually is um, So change set Passes an external parameters and marking which fields are required for validation. So we basically tell it like, okay, these two fields require validation. The validations are gonna be in the next part. Okay, so does that mean that any other parameters that I pass will not be passed to the database? So let's say I have a password field, but you can never update it or whatever, true this model. And I remove this. So let's say I have a field called password. I don't this this is not really a valid use case, but it's a string. Everyone, We're just gonna save the database in plain text, Papa. Sub Legion, how's it going? Um Does that mean that if I ever pass password to this change set, it will never actually get there? I think that's what it is. I think it will filter out all the stuff that you haven't allowed here. That's what I think it is. It's kinda like safe params in, 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 in Ruby, but that's on controller level. This is like on on model level. So you tell it like, okay. What are the advantages over, of Elixir over Erlang? If you know a little bit of Erlang, because I want to learn one of these languages. So the advantage of Elixir is basically the syntax because <laughs> it's legit just, it is compiled to Elixir or to Erlang. So it is using Erlang, it's using their VM, um, it's using everything. It's just the syntax is a lot better in my opinion. It goes, it comes a lot closer to Ruby and it's a lot more, it's a lot cleaner. So if you do like Elixir versus Erlang, I think you'll see like the syntax, syntactic differences. Uh, this doesn't see, seem to be like what that it is. Syntax. Mm. Airline Python, Syntax, Ruby. Hmm, can't find it. Yeah, I can't find it. So we can just search for Airline Syntax, I guess. So this is Erlang, and then we have Elixir, <laughs> of course, kind of hard to read, yeah. Uh, this is what it is, yeah. Uh, oh, it's actually not that different. It's a little different. It has like random arrows here. I think these, these are all based on indentation. Could be. It's just a different syntax. Like it's literally just an abstraction on top of uh, of Erlang. So it's just whatever you prefer. It is it is actually compiled to Erlang. So whatever you write here will just be Erlang and then run as Erlang on the VM. Like languages with brackets. All right. So where were we? So. We were talking about chain sets, about schemas, and 
We can fire red functionality. Uh -huh. Let's fire up our application inside of IEX. We're gonna get a mix. All right. Well, we can do that actually, probably. This is so alien. True, it is. It really is. Let's alien. What does alias? What does alias do? Oh, it just. Wait, what does alias do? Oh, alias is that I don't have to write the whole namespace. So my namespace for this one, for this playlist is, uh, where is it? Jizzro Cat's playlist playlist. Now I think I can just use playlist. Yes, okay, so a little shorter now. <laughs> That's all it does. So let's make a chain set. Let's make a chain set, uh, playlist. A change set and then we have to make an empty playlist the playlist model struct basically thing and then we pass nothing no attributes and then we get back a chain set which has errors on it because it compa it compared the resource the model the schema definition against a set of attributes that i passed like key values and it had noticed that the title wasn't there and that the url wasn't there and then it says valid is false so if we do change that but valid it says false but if i were to make a new one with the change set of title equals Bob Ross and uh, the URL. Is this actually like this? Written like this? Or is it like, like this? Let's try this. This probably seems more like it. URL is like HTTPS google.com. This is not even saving anything. This is just, just like doing validation. You're asking chain set to validate basically Playlist against a set of our uh, attributes. So now it's valid because the values, the changes are these. There's no errors. It's a valid chain set. Change set is valid. This is true. The Erlang or Elixir is not so important. The frameworks available for the for the work are more important. Oh, it's honestly just like whatever you want to do. I think Elixir. Elixir slash Erlang is has proven to be very, very good. Like if you look at like big, big applications that require real time stuff and like a, a high uptime, Elixir and Erlang are, have been proven to be very, very proficient. If you look at WhatsApp's uptime, it's insane. Like it was, it was originally designed to work for the telecom market for like telecommunication software so it has like a lot of fail safe uh things that if your if your process inside of your application crashes it will just restart so like in my app here um the app is legit just spawning processes all around that's legit the only thing it does so if i go to my app where is my app No, oh, here application you can see that all this does the application start is legit just supervising two two children here so this is only the this is only the the app the lib part not really the web part um it is checking for repo so it's it's creating a supervisor for the repo and it create it supervises the endpoint and an endpoint is probably uh where is it Endpoint yeah here. This is basically my routing and my middleware. So basically my web server kind of. And then my web server is my router and everything. Um which is sick, you know? Which is which is nuts. It's crazy. So if any of these crash ever it will restart. So it has a one one for one. So if one crashes, it will restart itself. 
So most of the applications um, that use Airlong are pretty, pretty decent. It depends on the nature of the problem. And currency and stability. True. I think so. Like, honestly, I haven't worked with it enough to actually be able to see this. This is what has been sold to me, you know? Like, this is when I look at videos and like, I've, I've been to a couple of Elixir meetups. Um, this is what you always hear. This is the stuff you always hear. I mean, you can still... It's it's like you... It, the, the Erlang application runs on a VM. You boot up the VM once. It takes a little while for it to boot up. But the thing is, you never have to reboot it. That thing should run. And you should never be able to crash the VM. Like, there's only a couple ways you can crash the VM. And then your application can crash, but the VM will never crash, so it will just reboot. Airline Beam aren't the fastest things in the world. But if your problem decomposes into smaller processes nicely, then it's a good choice. Is it? Is it not the fastest thing in the world? I thought it was actually pretty decently fast. Welcome, Keith. How's it going? But yeah, this is... I'm completely new to this world. I'm still learning a lot. It's pretty slow. I know it's slow in, like, startup. But I think... Erlang itself is not that slow, is it? It's just, it's just the beam VM takes a, takes a while to boot up. But yeah, I don't know, like, there's a, there's multiple definitions of slow, you know, like. Like, sir, you have a good book? I think there's a free ebook if you go to the Elixir website. And I have a couple of books that I bought on the on the Humble Bundle sale when there was like a functional programming one. I think there's like a book here. Yeah, programming Elixir. This is what I've skimmed through. I've never seen this book, but apparently there's another book. There's another book. There's even more books. There's books and or there's, this is videos, I think. No? Books? Videos? Interactive courses? What we're just doing. We're just gonna build shit. <laughs> by, by doing that, we're, we're learning, you know? I hate people that say learning based on a framework is bad, because I don't agree. If you get shit done and it makes you have fun with it, and you... Like, I'm not, like, building something now and just not looking at or under, trying to understand what it does. Like, I'm actually, like, spitting into the code and trying to understand what, what everything is, you know? Like, how does it work? I think that's bad. If you just use a framework and then just not want to try and understand what it actually does under hood and just make assumptions, then I think that's bad. But as long as it gets shit done, you know, it's, that's what you got to do. That's what I like to when, like in the JavaScript world. There's a lot of people that say jQuery is, is horrible. And I mean, you shouldn't really use it for new projects. But if you're learning, like, why the fuck should you not use jQuery? I mean, in my opinion, you should. It makes makes so much easier for you to learn. And then later on, you will you will understand that you don't need jQuery, you know. But if you're just learning, then just just go for it. All right. So where were we? So we made an an, an empty chain set. That's cool. So now we understand that um, we create an empty user struct with a set of parameters. It, it validates against those parameters. It pipes it true. It hits the first. Uh, it hits cast. It sees that those. Uh, attributes were not present because we added no attributes, so it's like, well, you're fucked. Or actually, this is not the validation part. So what if we take out the validation? What would happen? Does this auto-reload? Reload. reload. <laughs> How do I reload? Recompile. Oh. Look at that. Okay, so what if we do the same thing now? So let's add empty again. So alias this. Let's do an empty... So 
So now it is valid because we don't do validations. Okay, but what if I add something that isn't that isn't on the model itself? So let's say cool story is true. Story is true. Still valid, but you can see there's no changes made. So what if I remove the cast in like altogether? So let's recompile. Unused import chain set. Fair badge is unused. It's fine. It's all warning. So. The seasons come and go like thoughts huh. of you. Like a wave okay, fair. I mean, I don't get a chain set back now because. Uh, because we don't use cast. <laughs> So I'm still trying to figure out what cast actually does. Or is it not mo used more widespread? I think it's used very... Well, it's very decently used. I think a lot of people from the Ruby world are switching over because Ruby is even worse. Like, it's even slower. And like, the framework is set up in a, in a way that... It's like pretty nasty sometimes if you don't abstract it correctly. Um, and you hit against some roadblocks sometimes. So a lot of people are like open to try this out because the syntax is kind of similar, but it solves a lot of the issues that you run into. Um, but for, for like the mainstream object oriented folks, I don't think this is very very entry level it's like different syntax to them they don't have their they have to get used to their do's and their ends you know plus the fact that it's a lot harder to get used to the fact that you're doing functional programming so you don't work with your your classes and your instances and like inheritance and whatever so for a lot of people it's a pretty big step and for me too honestly it's like a pretty big step into entering this world but I'm willing to take it, you know, like, I think it's cool. And I think it was like, the amount of like magic that is involved or like the amount of tracking down is not, doesn't feel as big um, in functional programming. It's not, it's also not always a great fit to use something that's, that is functional. True, definitely, definitely. Um, it's also often not worth to switch an existing code space to a lot. Yeah, don't do it. Just don't. Most of the times, it's definitely not worth. Unless you're hitting like roadblocks like roadblock of the language, and then you should like maybe migrate some parts of the application. But yeah, it's up to you. A lot of functional programmers don't like it because it's not statically typed. True. Is our airline also not statically typed? Huh. So I'm still trying to figure out what cast does. Change set cast. Many times the, the data given on cast needs to be further pruned. Yeah, I don't, I want to know what cast is. Change post title foo apply changes. Yeah, that's like that function. I want to see where cast here applies the given params as changes for the given data according to the given set of keys. Returns a change set. Applies the given params. So you pass it the schema and then the parameters. So exactly what we do. 
No, wait. You pass it attributes. And then you... And then you give it a list of permitted ones. Yeah, Discord uses Elixir too, actually. WhatsApp uses it too. They might use it for Messenger as well. Well, maybe not, actually. Messenger is already pretty old. So you do give it the first parameter. So wait, how does pipe work in uh, in in uh, Elixir now? What the fuck? Am I am I confused now? I want to see string uppercase. Takes a string, right? Takes one. Hence with this. Yeah, let's check ends, ends with. Where is the parameter pass? Is this pass as the first argument and then this is the second? Or is this... This returns a function or not? I don't understand. Maybe like... Takes a string. So... Okay, so this works a little different than pipe pipe operator in some other languages that I've seen it. Because what I'm used to is that it has it uses one argument and then it returns a function. So it would ends with would oh maybe it's just for convenience. When you use this in a pipe, there's probably multiple Maybe it is auto curry currying or whatever, but this is interesting because what I thought would if you pipe it It would be like cast with this Would return a function that would take an extra argument, which would be like the data So then playlist would be put in here But it just actually passes the first argument so like cast is like this So I could also write it at this if I wanted to This would also work. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. I thought maybe it did auto carrying carrying, so like the last argument would be the, like the playlist then. And then it would be filling like this. Or like I did like this that's what I thought and then the result of this will be passed to the input of this one so this will be basically this hmm interesting Interesting. Maybe there's some magic going on. Wouldn't be surprised. Anyhow, so that basically means that I can make my own method, take the first argument, pipe that, and then add extra options to it. Right. Hmm, okay, fair. Uh, let's continue. So we still don't really know what, what cast does so cast takes a schema you tell it the parameters 
that you want to check for and then you pass it the parameters an array of the parameters that with atoms or with strings that you allow but what does it do given the data maybe be either a chain set a schema struct or whatever the second argument is a map of parameters that the cast according to the type uh-huh parameter is the map uh with string keys or a map with atom keys it's, it's a map not an array um during casting all permitted parameters will have their key name stored to an atom and stored as a change in the changes field that is what i said okay okay so let's say i add now remove this so i reload so it's not reload it was recompile and then i add cool story it will map it will map against the schema and the allowed parameters so if I were to say cool story is now allowed, but it's not on the schema, what will happen? Why oh, is password there? So recompile, the exact same thing. It will throw an error. Unknown field cool story. Only fields, embeds, and associations, except for true ones, are supported in chain sets. Okay, I don't understand anymore. Okay, so let's say I only allow title, and I pass URL. URL is on the schema. So it will not show up in the changes, even though it has a value on the schema. So this will not be passed to the actual database changes. So if I were to say, okay, change set is now title equals Bob. And then the URL to be set, it would only add this parameter as an actual change to the database or like whatever data source you're, you're using. Yo, Blue Ace, thanks for the follow, man. Appreciate that. That is interesting. Okay. There's no validation, obviously. It's just like, oh, if there's... It's also valid if you have no changes. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. It's interesting that you do that on model level. But sure. I don't know how that's what the use case for that is but maybe we'll get there later you know because i kind of feel like this is something similar as like strong parameters in in reels where you like specify like oh you're the the uh user input that you that you send uh i'm only gonna permit these fields from the from from the payload that you're sending to me, um, but these are these are not done at model level or like schema level. You know, like of course you can only send the fields that I have, but you're supposed to be able to change everything. Or maybe you can make changes without the chain set, so like internal properties that are not allowed to be set by chain set. You would change them by something else, maybe like another method, like an internal job, maybe. Maybe that's how that works. Maybe that's what this is for. So like, you would not use the change set, but you would like use an internal job that would trigger a change some other way without this change set. I don't know. Like maybe with an actual repo update. Hmm. Um, I'm not really sure what what the use case this is for, but we'll see. But we really have some hours ago. You have no idea what's happening? Same. <laughs> All right. So the validation required makes sense. This is just like, is this a, is this a, the proper type? Is it there? 
Can't be blank. Yep. So what if I said that this is supposed to be a string? So what if I make? So let's re recompile this again. Let's say I make this uh, title uh, an integer. It would also. Okay, so wait, is this coming from the validation or is this cast? Maybe that's cast. So cast is maybe just checking the type. Yeah, so... Okay. Right. So cast is literally just checking the type. And then validation is checking for whether it's set or not. Okay. That makes sense. That is a lot cle clearer now. If I don't set the URL, what will happen? It is valid because it's a chain set. Because we don't have these set, but what if I reload and I run this now without a URL? It would be URL can be blank. Okay. Okay. I see now. So, okay. Sure, sure. Random key, random value. You will not see random key, right? Yeah. A new chain set is valid. The chain set changes our bio, email, na name, number of pads. Notice that the random key and random value have been removed. From the final chain set, the chain sets allow us to cast external data, such as user input on a web form or data from a CSV file into a valid data into our system. Invalid parameters will be stripped and bad data is unable to cast according to our schema will be highlighted in the chain set errors. Okay. Some more validation pipes that you can use. Makes sense. Okay. All right, that's the, I understand chain sets now. Okay. So we've talked about migrations and data storage, but we haven't yet persisted any of our schemas or change sets. We briefly look at the repo module and hello repo at X. Okay, let's take a look at repo. So OTP app is general cats and an init keyword put options URL and then set the system URL. Is keyword an, an actual like thing from Phoenix or is that a thing from Elixir? That's from Elixir. Keyword. Set of functions for working with keywords. Keywords is a list of two element tuples where the first element of the tuple is an atom and the second element can be any value. For example, the following is a keyword list. Elixir provides a special uh a more concise syntax for keyword lists that look like this. Up, Chris, how's it going? I'm doing fine, Aurelio. Thanks for asking. Glad you're a good shit too. How are you doing, Crystal? So there's a couple of methods. Keyword drop, so you can remove certain well, fields. <laughs> Yo, Hester, welcome back to the Cat Community for 17 years of resubscribe and welcome back. Thank you so much for the resub, man. 17 years. Can we get some one of us in a chat for Hester? Thank you so much. That was awesome. 17 years is a long time. All right, it's just a helper for working with lists. Who 
work in with keyword. So keyword is a list of two element tuples. Okay. Sure, it's just helpers. Okay, so we took a look at our repo. It's It initializes um, the repo. Now it's time to put and use Ecto's repo as already interface into a storage system, be it a database like Postgres or an external service like a RESTful API. Huh. Huh. Okay. That's cool, actually. Hmm. The repo module's purpose is to take care of the finer details of persistence and data querying for us. As the caller, we only care about fetching and persisting data. The repo takes care of the underlying database adapter communication, connection pooling, and error translation for database constraint violations. Let's head back into IAX with IAX Mix and insert a couple of users into the database. We already have data, so it doesn't really matter. But we can do it. So repo insert. So we alias hello repo and hello user. So we take from the, I think this is like, you take, you deconstruct repo and user from the hello module. So you have like hello.repo and hello.user, but you don't want to write two aliases, so you, you combine them, you just destruct them in one line. That is kind of cool. Then we can do repo insert and basically using the hello repo. And then we create a user struct, user schema struct, and we pass it an email. And then there's no chain set. You don't use chain sets here because you, you want to do it raw, so you use you pass in the schema with the values so like with the changes not the changes actually i think you need to change that you need a change set to actually change i think that's what we need so insert is fine but what if you need to change so repo all user then you need to resource so then you need the schema as well, but then the schema module. So if I do repo uh, alias just draw cats. Was it just cats like this? Let's see if we still did alias. Yeah, here. So place is still there. Can we do a repo? So what is our repo? Visual Cats repo. So if we now do repo.all and then playlist, we would get a list of all playlists. And it does this exact query. Select P0 ID, P0 title, P0 URL, P0 insert that, P0 updated that from playlist as P0. Now we get an array of playlist schemas. Structs. Okay. Import query, acto query. So then acto query is just a set of helpers to write queries. Because Ecto query is inside of the uh, here, right? No, in here. Ecto query, yeah. Import Ecto query. So I guess are we using it here? Or is this all part of Ecto query? I think this is just. What is repo? Ecto repo. What's up, Captain Pandu? How's it going? What's going on here? Yeah, I don't even know myself, man. I don't even know what's going on. Restore this whole file real quick. Apparently, my changes. Um, that was easy. Repo all takes the data source, our user schema in this case, and translate that underlying SQL query against our database. 
After it fetches the data, then the repo uses the active schema to map the database values back into the Elixir data structures according to our user schema. We're not just limiting it to basic query. Ecto includes a full-fetched query DSL for advanced SQL generations. In addition to the natural Elixir DSL, Ecto's query engine gives us multiple great features such as SQL injection protection and compile time optimization of queries. Let's try it out. Okay. Let's do it. So let's import an Ecto query. So now we have, we have access to query. All the, f all the features that are in there. So if I do repo all, and then we do from P in playlist, select P title. And then we only get the title. So we get an array of titles. So repo one, so we've only find the first user where the title is. Let's create another one. Let's get a new playlist. So let's call it Bob and then google.com. Cool. Now we have two playlists, one with the title Reparino, one with Bob. And now we're going to search for a playlist. So repo one. So we only want to have one result from P in playlist where I like P title is I like an SQL thing? I didn't know. I thought it was just like, or maybe it's like pattern matching. Oh, that's a Postgres thing. So you have like and then I like. I like is similar to like in all aspects except for one thing. It performs a case sensitive, case insensitive matching. Hmm. Okay. All right. All right. So I like, okay. Uh, so I like, and then uh, let's match on the character B. Is that how that works? And then select the count of PID. I fucked up. From P in place where I like where Colin oh I forgot this. From Okay, so from this point on it's like a right. One. That's that's okay. That's good. If we, were, if we were to remove this where, it should have two. Because it's a total count of two. Okay. That's that's cool. I didn't know that I like existed. I only know that like existed. Um... Well, this is nice. This is pretty sophisticated. Rich querying cables. Yeah, this is nice. So you can say from user, from you as a user, select and then have, um, what is this? This is like a hash map or whatever. I don't know what this is called. Exert types. Not a tuple. Also not a linked list. Elixir hash map. I think it's a map. Map. Yeah, it's a map. Um, so you can say select map 
and then take the user uh, user ID as the key and the value the user the user email. That is pretty fucking neat. That's pretty cool. Little query packed a big punch. It both fetched all users email from the database and efficiently built a map of results in one go. That's really fucking neat. In addition to insert, we can also perform updates. Repo update, repo delete, to update. Using my SQL, change a bunch of stuff. Okay. So what I'm missing now is what this file is. Is this just some helpers that you can write yourself? So now I understand a little better what alias does too. Because I don't want to write this all the time. I just want to write playlist. Because otherwise I have to replace playlist everywhere here with like Chisel Cats playlist playlist. And query allows me to do all the querying. With like all the helpers and shit that we actually don't really use here. I think. I think we're not really using any helpers. Yeah, I don't think so. Um. Oh, con this is a context. So we're talking about context here. So far we've built pages, wired up controllers, actions through our, our routers, learned about how Ecto validates data and, and persisted. Now it's time to tie it all together by writing a web phasing features that interacts with our greater Elixir application. When building a Phoenix proje project, we first and foremost build an Elixir application. Phoenix's job is to provide a web interface for, into our Phoenix applications. Naturally, we compose our applications with modules and functions, but simply defining a module with a few functions isn't enough when designing an application. It's vital to think about your application's design when you write code. Let's find out how. How to read this guide. Using the context generators is a great way for beginners and intermediate Elixir programmers alike to get up and running quickly and thoughtfully design their applications. This guide is focused on those readers. On the other hand, experienced developers may get more mileage from nuanced discussions around application design. For, the, for those readers, we include a frequently asked questions section at the end of the guide, which brings different perspectives to some design decisions that, may, that are made throughout the guide. Beginners can s safely skip the uh, fact sections and return later when they're ready to dig deeper. Okay. That's cool. I'm like, I'm like down for both, but let's first explain about why they ma made it like this. So contacts are dedicated modules that expose group of functionality uh, related functionality. So I think these are, you kind of relate them to like services. This is like the playlist service. That gives me all the power to like get a playlist, list all the play playlists, create a playlist, update a playlist, delete a playlist, and some other business logic around playlists. While not really touching the the schema. So like in Reels, these are both together. Both the schema and the model or like the service is together. So this is Honestly, I like this design a lot better because my models got pretty fat while not really explaining exactly what the what the underlying schema is. So like your services can just have like list this, do this, but not even, yeah. You hacked Mark Zuckerberg yet? Yeah, I did. Two times already. Um, for example, anytime you call Elixir standard library, be it logger.info or stream.map, you're accessing the different context. Internally, Elixir's logger is, is made of multiple modules, such as logger.config and logger.backends. But we never interact with those modules directly. We call the logger module, we call logger, we call the logger module the con wait we call the logger logger module the context 
Exactly because it exposes. Is this a proper sentence or is this just me? We call the logger module the context. Oh, we call the logger module the context exactly because it exposes all uh, exposes and groups all the logging functionality. Right. Okay, this is good to know. Because this is like an elixir term. Context. Or maybe this is like a yeah. Well, I call it a service. But you can call it context as well. I like to call it a service. Phoenix projects are structured like Elixir and any other Elixir project. We split our code into context. A context will group related functionality such as posts and comments, often encapsulated patterns such as data access and data validation. By using context, we decouple and isolate our systems into manageable independent parts. Let's use these ideas to bundle out our web application. Our goal is to build a user system as well as a basic content management system for adding and editing page content. Exactly what we want. So that explains a lot. Because we generated HTML, but you can also generate JSON and a just a context in general. So that basically means that you didn't build a model or you didn't build your schema, or this is also right. This probably also generates a schema. There's no page for it. So basically generating this context or a resource is basically what you're doing here. Alright, Phoenix include generates that apply the ideas of isolating functionality into your into context. These generators are great. Uh, in order to run the context generators, blah blah blah. We already did that, that's fine. Before we use the generators, we need to undo the changes we made into the in the ecto guide. Okay, so ecto reset, blah blah blah. So we generate HTML user accounts. Yep. Exactly what we did. It's pretty much what we did with the playlists. Cool, cool. Before we run, before we jump into generate code, start enough. Is the let's follow the what up? Uh, should be greeted with the following match. Oops, something went wrong. Please check the errors down below. Okay. Yeah. Exactly, that's what we get. Something went wrong here. Okay, that's good. Out of the box, context generators include, uh, included the schema fields in our form template and we can see our default validations for requiring inputs are in effect. Can be blank, can be blank. So enter some example user data to res uh, resubmit the form. Yeah, we already have some resources. Doesn't matter. We get the list of all users, blah, 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 starting with generators. The little gen HTML command packed a surprising punch. We got a little, we got a lot of functionality out of the box for creating, updating, and deleting users. This is far from full featured app, but remember generators are first and foremost learning tools and starting points for you to begin building real features. Code generation cannot solve all problems, but it will teach you the ins and outs of Phoenix and nudge you towards the proper mindset when designing your application. This is exactly the thing that I did. Exactly. I scaffolded uh, an HTML resource just to see what the fuck they did. And then we started exploring how this, how everything works and how everything sits out and what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, let's check the user controller. So I think this one is pretty clear. But let's, let's, I guess, like, read it through. Index section, yeah, I already know that. I looked at account context. So we don't know yet how to use a phishing. Uh, but that's, that's the point. Phoenix controller is a web interface into our greater application. It shouldn't be concerned with all the details of how users are fetched from the database or how it persists into storage. 
Yeah, exactly. So this is MVC, you know, like a controller shouldn't know about how the data is fetched and just ask the, the person that's responsible for it to ask me for the data. And then the view is, is like responsible for rendering. We don't know. The controller doesn't know how to render. It just delegates that to the, to the render, to like a view. Um, yeah, we're only telling our application to perform some work for us. This is great because our business logic and, and storage details are decoupled from the web layer of our application. That is also... It is, it isn't, it is actually the same as in Rails. But it feels a little different. Because everything is still in app. And Rails is only, only web. While here, your business logic is legit in a different folder. Web is legit just a different project. So you have Jizzle Cats, which is your, just your 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 module, your ba your base, and then you have Jizzle Cats in here, which is Jizzle Cats application, and then this one has all your business logic. So this one has your schemas, your services or contexts. It has your repo, and then web just has like web related stuff, like your your uh, web socket connections and your routes and your HTML, your templates. Okay. We use put flash. Where? Okay, so let's check the here, put flash. Yeah, put flash info playlist created successfully on error render to chain set. That's cool. Like dig deeper into the context. So he goes to the context now. So let's open the context. This module will be the public API for all account functionality in our system. For example, in addition to user account management, we may also handle user logging credentials, account preferences, password reset generation. And if we look at list users function, we can see the private details of user fetching. It's all and it's super simple. We call repo all user. We saw how Acto repo query worked in the re in the Acto guide, so this call should look familiar. Our list users function is a generalized function specified specifying the intent of all our code, namely to list users. The details of that intent, where we use our repo to fetch the users from Postgres, uh, is hidden from our callers. Yeah, so this is abstracted away. So we don't actually want to do all the repo stuff. This is like in our service that is that guy is only allowed to ask them the schema to check to ask the shit from the database. Uh, da, 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 da. Now we know how data is fetched, but how our users persisted. Take a look, create user, create user. Uh, first we see again that Actor is under the hood. You probably noticed the user chain set two. We talked about chains before and now we see them in action in our context. If we open user schema, yes. Uh, except we see a doc false above the chain set two function. This tells us that while this functionality is publicly callable, it's not part of the public context API. Callers that build chain sets, chain sets do so via the context API. For example, oh shit. Wow. So you basically warn devs to not call this one directly and to not show it as like part of the available public API because you're only supposed to call this using your service or using your context that you created. Interesting. Makes sense though, because there's a lot of, there can be a lot of like business logic in there. In context relationships. Our basic user features are nice, but let's top it up a notch by supporting user logging credentials. We won't, 
implement a complete authentication system, but we'll give ourselves a good start to grow such a system from. Many auth authentication system solutions couple the user credentials to an account in a one-to-one -one fashion, but this often causes issues. For example, supporting different login methods, such as social login or recovery email addresses, will cause major code changes. Let's set up a credential association that will allow us to start off checking the single credential per account, but easily support me more features later. For now, user credentials will contain only email information. Our first order of business is to decide where credentials live in the application. We have our accounts context, which manages user accounts. User credentials is a, is a natural fit here. Phoenix is also smart enough to generate code inside an existing context, which makes adding re new resources to a context a breeze. Run the following command at your project root. I see. So you can actually generate an association. So generator context accounts, that's the one that's one of the resources. Credentials and then the credentials table. And then tell it that an email string should be unique. User ID ref references user. The users table. Oh wait, so this is like accounts credential. So you tell it to be it in a module accounts and then credential. Okay. But well, we open up a credentials table. And we give it an email and then a user ID. And then you, before you run migration, it tells you to change the migration real quick because <laughs> it didn't add no falls. So apparently that's not able to be said. I'm getting sleepy. Um, we need to make one more change to, to enforce data integrity for users account credentials. In our case, we want a user's credentials to be deleted when the parent user is removed. Make the following change to the no false. Oh, undelete, delete all. No false. So on the lead, you want to delete. So when the user is deleted, so when re references user on the lead of the user, delete all. All of the credentials that are associated with that user. We change the on the lead from nothing to on delete all, which will generate a foreign key constraint that will delete all credentials for a given user when the user is removed from the database. Likewise, we also pass no false to disallow creating credentials without an existing user. By using a database constraint, we enforce data integrity on a database level, rather than relying on an ad hoc or error prone application logic. Next, let's migrate up our database as Phoenix instructed. So we, we act to migrate. Before we integrate credentials in the web layer, we need to let our context know how to associate users and credentials first. First, open up the account user. So this is the schema. And then we alias accounts, user, and credentials. So we're deconstructing two extra aliases. So both user and credential. And then we say schema has one credential. So a user now has one credential and then the credential. This is another schema. So we pass in the schema. Cool. We use this is also interesting though, because in Ruby, you're just uh, passing it in like this. So it has many points transactions, which is not actually an actual module or anything. But here it is an actual like schema module um so then in credentials 
you have to add belongs to a user. We use the belongs to macro to map our child relationship to the parent user. With our schema association set up, let's open up accounts.ex and make the following changes to the generated list your users and get users. So whenever you fetch a user, you preload credential table. Preload credential association whenever we fetch users. The repo preload functionality fetches a user's schema association data from the database, then places it inside the schema. When operating on a collection, such as a query in the list, list users, Ethic can efficiently preload associations in a single query. This allows us to represent our accounts user struct as always con containing credentials without the caller having to worry about the fetch the extra data. Right. That makes sense. So we're always doing this joint. Is that correct? So expose our new feature to the web by adding a credential input to our user form. So it has an email now. And it's, no one submit was already there. We use Phoenix HTML input for function to add associations nested fields within the parent form. Within the nested inputs, we render our credentials email field. Uh, inputs for for the form. So I think that we have a form four in there. Let's see. I actually don't know what they what it renders. I haven't checked the view actually. So on a playlist, no template. On the new or edit, great. It renders the form, and then form four chain set sf. Right. So label f, and then the field title. Yeah. Now let's show the user's email address in the user show template. Now if we visit da, 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 we'll see the new email input, but if you try to save the user, you will find that the email field is ignored. No validations are run telling you it was blank or the data. Is it because of... Oh, you have to add it there too. Sub Yantik, thanks so much for the follow. I thought maybe we had to change it in here. Like maybe in the... In the cast. But it's obviously a different model, so you wouldn't say like, oh, email is also a, f a field because that's already in the in the credentials schema. Um, so you have to up change the business logic in the context. So, so the create user and the update user. So we have playlist here, create playlist and update playlist. So if we have an association, what do you do? Ecto change set cast association credential with credential change set two. So I see. So the result of the change set, so the change set is piped into the Ecto change set cast association. And then you tell it the association is credential with, and then you pass it the to change that you want to use. Right. So then it will also ch add the validations based on the credentials association. And if that's okay, then it will update. And if that's okay, then it will insert. Okay, that's interesting. So Bruno, how's it going? We updated the functions to pipe the user's chain set into castlesock 3 Actus Castlesock allows us to tell the chain set how to cast user input to a schema relation. User input to a schema relation. We also use the width option to tell Ecto to use the credential chain set 2 to cast the data. Right. Right. Because in credential chain set 2, it has something exactly like this. Cast these only allow for these. Right, it makes sense. And tell them what type they should be. 
So everything is like their own responsibility. If you want to validate for credentials and allow them to be changed in the database, then you have to pass it that validation, which is on the cred credential. Um, on the credential schema chain set uh, method. Finally, if you visit local storage or local host 4000 user new, attempt to save an empty email address, you will see a proper validation error message. If you enter va valid information, the data will be cast and persisted properly. It's not much to look at yet, but it works. We had relations with our context complete with data integrity enforced by the database. Not bad. Let's keep on building. So as we've seen, your context module are modules are dedicated modules that expose a group related group related functionality. Phoenix generates generic functions such as list users and update users, but they only serve as the basis for you to grow your business logic and application from. To begin extending our accounts context with real features, let's add an obvious issue to our application. We create users with credentials in our system, but they have no way of signing in with those credentials. Building a complete user authentication system is beyond the scope of this guide, but let's get started with basic email only sign in page would allow, uh, that allows us to track a user's current user's session. We will let us focus on extending our accounts context while giving you a good uh, start to grow a complete uh, uh, authentication solution. To start, let's think of a function that describes what we want to accomplish. To authenticate a user by email, we'll need, to, we'll need a way to look up the user and verify their existing credentials are valid. Uh, we can do this by exposing a single function on our accounts context. So they have accounts, we have playlists. So we're not going to do this, but we should. So it just gen it just creates this on the context. So it's just like whatever me whatever random method is here. It's like and it takes an email and a password, but the password is not there because they didn't. They, he doesn't have a password. And then you make a query. And then it should, if it finds one, do this. That's cool syntax. Is this pattern matching? I think this is pattern matching. If whatever comes back from this looks like is the type, like is a user schema struct. Then we take that user. No, wait, this is the part that is in the do. So this is, this is matching. If user struct is matched against user. No, wait, how does this work? I understand what it does. So we return okay, like a, a tuple with okay and user, if it's okay. And we return error, like the atom error in a tuple and uh, unauthorized when we're not authorized. When we call this method. But I'm wondering about this part. But it will probably explain it. Okay. So it does a query for for from you and user interjoin the association with credential and then find uh, the credentials email is matching with the email that we got from wherever we call this method. If that is okay, or that is just the query and then we run the query and if we find one, because repo one is only going to yield one result. So it's always going to be either a complete user schema instance, like a schema struct, or it's going to be no if it didn't find anything. 
So it's gonna check for case. If the case is nil, we're gonna return a tuple with error atom and an undefined atom or an unauthorized atom. If we did find something, this part I don't really understand. If the user struct Let's check case. Case. Allows us to compare a value against many patterns until we find a matching one. Aha. Uh -huh. So if... If Confused. Let's let's do this one in here. So let's not do a select. Let's get the first a two inquiry. Why is that a bad thing? I want to have one. Get first. I want to get one. Oh, okay. Let's just do a where then. Where. Uh, I guess I do you like this. ID is equal to ID is equal to Error. I don't know how to do this anymore. No, 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 fuck. Uh, what's the syntax? Oh, yeah, we have to do that. Where P ID P dot ID is equal to one. How do I get get out of this? Abort. Just restart. Do I still have all those things? No. Fuck. I have to I have to run my aliases again. Alias repo. And alias uh playlist. This one. Is there spaces and fucking died? Okay. Okay, so now we have access to playlists. Now we have access to the other one. So now let's do the same query. Without breaking anything. Undefined from. Oh, we have to get the shit. We have to import the query. Import ecto query. Gonna break this one. Okay, let's do this again. Okay, so now we got one. So let's let's assign this to something. Playlist equals playlist equals this. So now playlist is this is an actual this. And now let's check if we do this. What will happen? Playlist equals playlist. Mm 
no match of right hand side value okay so if i do this and it will not be a user so if i've run this query and i will not get a user back which is really strange then this will error and this will break which is exactly what we want because that's a, a case that we haven't touched that will be fucking strange not even possible so it checks if the user left side which is a struct user struct matches with the user on the right and then the user is now kind of like a variable so you can use that in your actual response okay so then in here we can call this method and then when it's okay use so now we start pattern matching again or so in the case of accounts authenticated by email um we show a flash we create a session configure session they're all like cool new methods that i've never seen and then when the when the case is error unauthorized bad email address combination and send us back to the new page we find a session controller yeah singleton this is a singleton controller what does that mean We use resources generated. This is for the other ads, except this time we only pass the only path. We only want new, only to support new, create, and delete. We also use singleton true option, which defines all restful routes. It does not require a resource that need to be passed to the URL. Oh. Wow, what the fuck? I mean, it makes sense, but like, why would you res your use resource then? I mean, if you're only using new create and delete anyways, why would you need singleton? Because then none of your routes need like any addresses or like have any like resource IDs or whatever. doesn't make a lot of sense to me like if you already specified you only want new create and delete then why is singleton true needed uh anyways so private no yeah in our router yeah it's a route yeah it's a method wait does he do that in the router authenticate user will you find an authenticator plugin will you find an authenticator to plugin the router which simply uses plug connect get session to check for a user ID in a session. If we find one, it means a user has previously been authenticated or we can call into the user get user to place our current user into the connected assigns. But if we don't have a session, we add a flash message, redirect to the homepage and we use connection halt to halt further plugs downstreams from being invoked. We won't use this new plug quite yet, but it will be ready and waiting as we add authenticated routes in just a moment. Last we need we need session view to render a template for our login form. Create a new file. Yep, like this. Login, blah blah blah. 
To keep things simple, we added both our sign-in and sign-out forms in this template. For our sign-in form, we keep we pass the con, con directly to form 4, pointing our form actions at session path. We also pass s user option, which tells Phoenix to wrap the form parameters inside a user key. Next, we use the text input and password input functions. Da -da -da. For logging out, we simply defined a form that sends the delete HTTP method to server session session delete path. Now, if you visit the sign in page da -da -da, and enter a bad email address, you should be greeted with your flash message. Makes sense. Now that we have the beginnings of a user user account and credential features, let's begin to work on the other main features of our application, managing page content. Yeah, we're not gonna do that today. <laughs> it's already pretty late, so yeah. This has been an interesting uh, web CMS. Create a CMS author. Scope CMS. Here's a new scope, huh? Okay. Well, this has definitely been a super good guide, honestly. This is just literally the Phoenix docs. But they're talking about all this awesome shit that everybody will need. Makes total sense, you know? Anyways, thank you guys so much for hanging out. I'm gonna, gonna go off to, to bed. Let's see if we can host someone. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. Who should we host today, huh? Oh, get clumsy, get clumsy Jassy is live. She's cooking. Holy shit, we're going full creative today. Um, thank you guys so much for hanging out. This this stream will be uh, this stream vod will be available on the coding site. So I have a coding YouTube channel available here. And uh. Yeah, if you if you enjoy these, let me know and uh, check out the YouTube. See you guys uh, another time on the YouTubes, and uh, let's continue learning uh, learning Phoenix and Elixir. It's been pretty pretty good experience so far. Bye bye.